Hare Krishna. So today morning, I'll discuss on this topic of room for creativity in understanding scripture. This is a section of the Uddhav Gita and the Uddhav Gita is, we could say, the most philosophical section of the entire Bhagavatam. The second biggest philosophical section comes in Kapila's instructions to Devahuti. But this is chapter upon chapter of philosophy. And in this verse, Krishna is making something, making a very striking statement. He says that, Yatha Vaktum Vivakshitam. That means as as different sages, as different thinkers may wish to describe, they can describe material elements accordingly. So basically, this is Sankhya, Prasankhya Nama, as it was mentioned. So in different frames of reference, sometimes it is said material nature is made of 24 elements, sometimes 20 elements, sometimes 25, sometimes 26, sometimes 16. So uh, Krishna is saying that this doesn't have to be necessarily one right and the other wrong. Is according to their nature, according to their desires, they can describe material nature differently. So I'll speak this to class in three parts. So first I'll talk about how a model of reality is not the reality. Second point I'll talk about that if we position scripture as a competitor to science, then we may be trying to be more traditional than the tradition. And lastly, humility means to acknowledge the complexity of reality. And maturity means to find space for our reality while giving others the space for their reality. So, let's begin. First point is that there can be different models of reality. So for example, science has certain theories of how nature works. Now there are some scientists who are literalists who believe that their theory is how matter actually is. But at best what science can offer is approximations which are like models. So every model is like a map. A map is very useful for understanding the reality. Say if I want to drive, a map is useful. But a map is not an exhaustive description of the reality. So a map can show me this building is here, this building is here. But a map will not show how many people live in this building or how many people live in that building. So whenever we use any analytical framework for understanding things, an analysis means we divide things into their components. So we categorize. Now categorization is basically a mental construct that is applied on a physical reality. Say for example, if we consider now in India, the Kashmir issue is quite hot. So now on a geographical map, you might say, okay, India is here, Pakistan is here, Kashmir is here. But now if you actually go there, now there is no line on the ground saying this is Kashmir. So sometimes, you know, this particular land, is it, in Kashmir, is it in India or is it in Pakistan? Is this in China or is this in India? So for analytical framework, for analytical purposes, we can have like a neat map. But the reality is always much, much messier than whatever analytical framework we use. Now this doesn't mean the analytical framework is not useful. It is useful, but it need not be definitive. It need not be absolute. And so this is so sometimes we can have a like a physical map of a country and a political map of a country. The two can be quite different. The physical map will focus on the topographical features. Okay, this is a plain, this is a plateau, this is a hill, this is a lake, this is a river. And the political map will show, okay, this county ends over here. And this is under the jurisdiction of this part of the country. This is under this jurisdiction of that country, whatever. So the same reality, the country or the world, when pursued from different models, can seem somewhat different. Now we see this idea of different models in reality functioning in our day to day lives also. So for example, when we are sick, sometimes we may try Ayurvedic treatment, sometimes we may, take, um, we may take, try allopathic treatment. 
Now, allopathy and Ayurveda, they offer very different models of real, models of the body. In Ayurveda, the central point is said to be Jatra Agni, the digestive fire. Now, in the allopathic model, there is no such thing as digestive fire. There is metabolism happening in the body and for that there is breaking down and regeneration. But the idea of a fire is not there. So that which is central in the Ayurvedic model is not even present in the modern, in the modern model. But you know, allopathic medicine works for some people. Ayurvedic medicine works for some people. So how do we, we don't necessarily go about saying that Ayurveda is right and allopathy is wrong. You could say that each has its own specializations. Allopathy is good for acute diag diagnostic purposes and acute medicine, acute problems. For some chronic problems, Ayurveda might be better. This could be a rough classification. The point is that we usually approach this functionally, not ontologically. Ontologically means what is the actual nature of reality? So we say, okay, whatever works, take it and move on. And Prabhupada was like that. Prabhupada preferred Ayurveda. But he did not mandate Ayurveda for all his disciples and nor did he mandate it for himself. Here only when he was in London, when he had to, when he had some severe issue, he had a procedure done which is allopathic. So the point is that we, all that we can have for functioning in the world is models of reality. And a model, one model of reality may be more useful than another. But it's a model. So a model of reality is not the reality. The map is not the territory. So and here what Krishna is saying is that even within the Sankhya way of analyzing, different thinkers might come up with different models of reality. And in fact, Vishwanath Chakratakura says that Krishna, in this purpose, in this section, he says that Krishna says, I am pleased by the creativity that the sages exhibit in using their intelligence to analyze material nature in this way. So. This was the first point that we can have different models of reality and we can see, we, we can adopt a particular model based on its functional utility. So the second point is that if we position scripture as a competitor of science, then we may be being more traditional than the tradition. What do I mean? There are, that there are some people who think that to accept scripture, we have to reject science. If you want to be faithful, then reject science. It's not that simple. Science offers us certain models of reality. And scripture, the essential purpose of scripture is to give us the ulti answer to life's ultimate questions. So the way I talk about this is that Science is the study of matter. Scripture is the study of what matters. <laughs> what is really important in life? What counts? What will bring value to our life? Now, science cannot tell us that. Suppose somebody has a terminal disease and they have one year to live. Now science can tell, okay, if you take this medicine, you, you can live for maybe one and a half years or you can do this. This is how your body is going to deteriorate. But what you are going to do in that one year? What matters in life? Science doesn't tell us that. This is not to criticize science. It is to contextualize science. Every body of knowledge has a purpose. And with the, for that purpose, that body of knowledge is very powerful. But apart from that body of knowledge, that knowledge, but apart from that purpose, that body of knowledge may not serve much purpose. So, scripture is the study of what matters. Now, if we consider this point, within the scripture itself, this is implicit. Arjuna fought the Kurukshetra war. And now he heard, heard the Bhagavad Gita and then fought the war and won it. Now, did Arjuna win the Kurukshetra war based on the knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita that he learned from Krishna or based on the knowledge of archery that he had learned from Drona and practiced throughout his life? Archery. archery. Any other answers? Which knowledge led to Krishna's victory? Both. Both? Yeah. How? Because he needed the practical application from the archery and he needed Krishna's knowledge of what really matters in his quality of instruction. Yes, very good. He needed practical application from archery. So you could put it another way 
that what to do that we learn from scripture how to do we may learn from other sources so the purpose of life arjuna's question at the start of the bhagavad gita also was not to krishna was to krishna was not how do i shoot arrows how do i practice archery his question was prachami tvam dharma sammud chetah that i want to know what is dharma what is the right thing to do for me in life so scripture tells us what to do now there might be some scriptural knowledge which may also tell us how to do but even the scriptural characters learn how to do from other sources if we see shukadev uh, parikshit maharaj was a very competent king throughout his life and he heard the bhagavatam when he was about to die that means the he lived his life as a exemplary king as an exemplary devotee now you could say without hearing the bhagavatam does that make his life deficient now when i say without hearing the bhagavatam that does not mean that he was ignorant of the glories of bhagwan he knew the past times of the lord he was a great devotee but the specific activity of sitting down and exclusively hearing the bhagavatam that he did when he was about to depart from the world and the purpose of the bhagavatam is also very clear its purpose is uh, he, we can know the purpose jiva goswami says by looking at the context in his uh, tatva sandarbha he analyzes this how do you know what is the core message or the purpose of a book so he says look at various things so one of the things is look at the start look at the end look at what is most repeated look at what is most emphasized look at what is unique like that but we look at the question which parikshit maharaj asks he says what is the duty of a person about to die for that purpose bhagavatam is very clear it is all the analysis of the bhagavatam is there to help parikshit maharaj fix his mind on krishna the cosmology if you see i was a part of the cosmology team at one time for the planetarium and we did a study uh, even in the 15 to 25th chapters which talk, in the fifth canto we talk about bhagavatam's cosmology actually uh, it's only maybe once one eighth or one tenth of the verses are actually about any cosmic dimensions most of that is about okay in this place these are the people who live and this is how they worship the lord these are the prayers that they offer in this place this people live and they offer prayers so the purpose of the bhagavatam is not to give knowledge of cosmology the purpose of the bhagavatam is to describe how the whole cosmos is pervaded by dharma and devotion everywhere in the world people are practicing bhakti and therefore you should also practice bhakti so the point uh, of this is that within the tradition also there is a respect for non scriptural sources of knowledge arjuna learned archery and he used that archery and that did not get from bhagavad gita uh, parikshit maharaj ruled the kingdom throughout his life and he did not refer to uh, the bhagavatam during that time he knew of course that about devotion to the lord but he learned practical knowledge from various other sources so we don't so if there are some sources for there are other sources of knowledge we understand that they offer a model of reality and if that model of reality is functionally useful to say that in accepting this model of reality we are being unfaithful to scripture no it's not like that this model of reality is functionally useful use it <coughs> let's consider the the cosmology itself in our tradition astrology has been uh, quite often used and even our acharyas for example chakravarti pa vishnu chakravarti pa or others they have analyzed uh, the uh, horoscope of krishna the horoscope of chaitanya mahaprabhu and for the purposes of astrology no acharya has used the bhagavatam cosmology there are two cosmological traditions in india one is the puranic cosmology and the other is what is called the jyotishya cosmology uh, like surya siddhant is a book which bhakti sanskar thakur commented on and the siddhant is a whole set of texts which uh, describe cosmology and the siddhantic cosmology 
is what is used for astrological purposes. No one has used the Bhagavatam cosmology for astrological purposes. It just can't be used. The Bhagavatam cosmology is very different. And even prominent Indian mathematicians like Aryabhatta is considered to be one of the most prominent Indian mathematicians. Even he said that I can't understand Bhagavatam cosmology. And so the, the Jyotisha cosmology makes much more sense in terms of our empirical observations. So now there have been these two sources of knowledge and our Acharyas have commented on the Bhagavatam's cosmology but they have not tried to use the Bhagavatam's cosmology for in their context you could say practical purpose. Practical purpose is to, good, to say calculate the day, uh, tithis or calculate the uh, auspicious and auspicious times to do astrology. It is a practical use. So they use another source of knowledge and they did not consider that this ha I have to reject this to follow this or if I am using if I, I have to reject Jyotisha to follow Bhagavata or that if I am using Jyotisha I am rejecting Bhagavata. They themselves there is the whole principle of Achintya Bheda Bhed means we, we are you could say comfortable with contradiction that it doesn't have to be that every single conf conf contradiction has to be resolved immediately. So sometimes if some devotee is saying this is right and that what science says is wrong. Well, science is not one body of knowledge. In science there are many different theories and we have to look at what theory we are talking about and who is propagating it and whether it contradicts scripture. These are all very complicated questions. So when somebody says that Oh, to follow you have to be you either you choose scripture or you choose science if you position scripture as a competitor to science we are being trying to be more traditional than the tradition in Christianity they say that you are trying to be more Catholic than the Pope you know you are, you are thinking that you can be a greater Gaudiya Vaishnava than Chaitanya Mahaprabhu it's like that now we don't have to make that as a standard of faithfulness in fact if you put position scripture as a competitor of science we may end up devaluing scripture. De by devalue? Because even the, the original students of the scripture did not treat scripture as a source of material knowledge primarily. A source of spiritual knowledge. So scripture gives us what matters. But what happens, see if somebody has a lot of studied science deeply, has a lot of uh, faith in science because apparently science works in terms of providing us technology. So, and if you tell them you have to give this up to take this up, then what are we doing? We are committing violence on their spiritual life by making the con making their practice of spirituality conditional to their rejection of what have what gives them faith. So that is unhealthy. So this brings me to the third point, and that is, I said humility means to acknowledge the complexity of reality. And maturity means to find room for our reality while giving others room for their reality. So humility means that we are finite beings and reality can be very complex. That I cannot just take one statement from scripture and use that as a means of interpreting all of reality. But scripture is itself complicated. And reality, the world as we experience it is complicated. So which aspect of scripture will apply to which aspect of the world? We have to look at that carefully and then understand it. Sometimes uh, some, some, some people have this tendency to take, even some devotees, take the most uh, confrontational or extreme statements of Prabhupada and make them as the standard of faithfulness to Prabhupada. If you don't accept this, then you are not faithful to Prabhupada. But Prabhupada himself spoke different things at different times. And Prabhupada also responded to context. So now, what does it mean when Prabhupada responded to context? There is a uh, <coughs> book by Shila Prabhupada which some devotees use for scientific preaching. And that is Life Comes From Life. Now, I was attracted to Krishna Consciousness by its rational scientific presentation by devotees. 
and there are scientist disciples of Shri Prabhupada who have written certain books. They also attracted and impressed me quite a bit. But as life comes from life, it's a very difficult book for somebody who is coming from a scientific background to digest. And Bhakti Sahu Damodar Maharaj, with whom this was actually he, the conversations were there in Venice Beach in in LA. You know, he himself did not approve of distributing this book to new people. He said that is a private conversation of Prabhupada with his disciples. And in that Prabhupada used a strong word like fools and rascals. And it can appear very, very alienating. Now actually words also have certain connotations and certain denotations. Denotations is what they literally mean. Connotations is what they signify. So the word rascal, maybe 60, 70 years ago, had a very harmless connotation. That means like somebody has done something, somebody has done something mischievous. You rascal, what are you doing? It was, it was a word of reproach, but it's a very mild word of reproach. Today, if you call somebody a rascal, you know, it's like too strong. It sometimes can come off as a very strong word. And I did a, a systematic, I did a search in the Veda base, looking at how Prabhupada used his words. So, in all his books, with all the all the things that Prabhupada wrote as books. In Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam, CC, you know, there are something like maybe 500,000 words in that. And there Prabhupada has used the word rascal less than 20 times. And if you consider how many times Prabhupada has used the word Krishna, that thousands and thousands and thousands of times. So this word comes much more when Prabhupada is talking with his close disciples in a private setting. And Prabhupada did not, con did not use that word when he was talking with people in general. So now, if you look at that whole conversation as it is unabridged in the Veda base, not it's an abridged version is published in Life Comes From Life. So in the unabridged conversation, there's a very significant statement of Prabhupada. So there's one disciple of Prabhupada who says that, oh, you know, some, that Prabhupada, the scientists are the greatest enemies of people in today's world. And Prabhupada says, no, he said, scientists are doing their work, but to the extent that they oppose God, to the extent they deny God, we oppose them. We are not against their inquiring spirit, their knowing spirit. We are against their atheism. So now, intrinsically, science is neither theistic nor atheistic. Science is just a body of knowledge which requires, looks at the world around us and uh, looks for material explanations for material phenomena. Now, based on science, some people might arrive at theistic conclusions, some people might arrive at atheistic conclusions. <coughs> so, Prabhupada, if you see, if you read his works carefully, his, his critique is specific. It is against the atheism that is extrapolated from science. Mm. Technically, this is called as scientism. Not science, but scientism. Scientism is the idea that science has a monopoly on knowledge. That science is omniscient. And many scientists themselves reject this idea. So Prabhupada was, you could say, like a laser criticizing a particular thing. But many of us take Prabhupada's uh, statements and use that like a machine gun, indiscriminately shooting everyone. <laughs> so what happens is we end up making Krishna consciousness more difficult to accept for many people than it needs to be. That if we make, unre we, we make demands on faith which are very unre which people find very unreasonable, then this is not for me. So what it means is, humility means to acknowledge the complexity of reality. The world is complex, Shastra is complex, Prabhupada has also made many, many different statements. So, every person, so then that brings me to the last part, humility and maturity. Maturity means to find room for our reality, to, to make room for our reality while giving others room for their reality. That means, not that we are talking about moral relativism or philosophical relativism over here, it's talking that 
because reality is complex, sometimes different people may understand things differently. If you look at the broad Vedic path itself, Krishna strongly recommends Bhakti Yoga. But Krishna doesn't reject Karma Yoga or Gyan Yoga or Dhyan Yoga. Krishna gives room even for the worship of the Devdas. He said that is not the highest, but isn't condemned as demoniac they are doing it. There are so the mood of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita can be phrased as that from your place, at your pace, access the grace. Krishna is giving mercy from your place, at your pace, access the grace. So if somebody can access the grace of Krishna and take a bhakti, that is the best. But if somebody can't, and there, there is there is a multiplicity of options of what you can do for your gradual spiritual elevation. And that means Krishna is open to offer even non-bhakti options to people for their elevation. Now within devotees, sometimes if there are differences of opinion, we don't have to make this is right and that is wrong. Sometimes what happens? Uh, we take narrow theological uh, differences and label somebody. This person is a deviant. This person is uh, wrong. It's not like that. It's not that simple. Once uh, there was a Catholic nun who was uh, taking care of some orphan <laughs> girls. And as these girls were growing up, she asked one of the girls, uh, what do you want to become when you grow up? And she said, I want to become a prostitute. What? Oh God, oh Mary, holy Jesus, what have I heard? Oh girl, what did you say? She says, I want to become a prostitute. Thank God. I thought you said I want to become a protestant. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> sometimes we might make theological differences which are quite minor as more consequential than huge moral differences. So, so, so sometimes uh, as among devotees, sometimes conflicts start happening. But we need to understand that there are some devotees who will be more conservative and there are some devotees who will be more liberal. And as scientific research is advancing, it seems that just like we talk about a swabhava, our innate nature. So even being conservative or being liberal seems to be hardwired. Now some people want things to stay as they are. And some people are dynamic. They want, let's explore this, let's explore that. <coughs> now who is right? It is not that one is right or the sometimes things need to be kept as they are. Sometimes things need to be adjusted. That means, sometimes you may say, for Bhagavatam class, just come to the temple and hear the class. But if people's life is fast, they can't live, they can't come physically to the temple, then let's have live broadcast. Now that was not something which was done earlier. Now somebody might say, no, if you do live broadcast, then people will not come to the temple. Well, there are people who are anyway not going to come to the temple. Now, let them hear. So when do we keep things as it is? When do we change things? Now, this, there is no one right answer for this. So there has to be discussions and sometimes the conservatives are right, sometimes the liberals are right. And it's that, when I said maturity means to have, to find the space for our reality while giving others a room for their reality. That means what? That uh, should we be conservative, should we be liberal? Actually it's very difficult to mandate we should be. Because we are what we are and we can't change that too much. But what we can do is not claim that our way is the only right way. It's not that the conservatives, uh, the conservative approach is the only right approach. Sometimes we may uh, talk about Prabhupada, uh, glorify Prabhupada, I never compromised and that kind of statements. Now they're there, but Prabhupada was very resourceful in adjusting things so that people could be attracted to Krishna or rather so that people would not be alienated from Krishna. So, uh, <coughs> His Holiness Giriraj Maharaj is writing a biography of, uh, of the Juhu project. So, he's talking with him about his experiences with Shila Prabhupada. And he said that when Prabhupada would go to, in Prabhupada, at one level, he said, chant 16 rounds, follow four regs, and become he had devotees. That was what he wanted. 
But Prabhupada, when he was in India, most of his preaching at that time was going to people's houses and inspiring them to become life members. So for Indians, it was a big thing that if a sadhu should come to our house and take some prasad. So when Prabhupada would go, he said, if you become a life member, I'll come to your house. So then Prabhupada went to the house of thousands and thousands of people like that. And then I asked Maharaj that, now normally every Indian will have some altar in their house. And their altar, they will have they will have Krishna, they will have various devatas, they will have demigods and they will have semigods. <laughs> semigods is what? Say me God. <laughs> I am God. So now they have many godmen who claim to be God. So then I asked Maharaj, did Prabhupada ever when he was look at uh, go to the altar, would he criticize what was there on the altar? He says, I don't remember even one incident when Prabhupada did that. So at that time when, Prabhu, when these people are just new and they are trying to develop faith in Krishna and Prabhupada, that is not the point to criticize them. So that point where Prabhupada was accommodating them. So you could say here Prabhupada was liberal. Yes, he was not demanding that you start handing 16 rounds and follow 4 eggs. Just develop a connection with Krishna. So Prabhupada, so we could say outreach is like a, a, like a pyramid. You know, there can be some different people who may situate themselves at different levels. So we might be situated here and somebody else might be situated here. We might be, somebody else might be situated here and we might be situated here. Or it not be necessarily lower and higher. You know, we might be going up the pyramid from this side and somebody might be going up from the pyramid from this side. And we and they will see things differently. So maturity means to find the space for our reality while giving others a room for their reality. So some devotees who are very scientifically minded now they may not be able to digest this idea of science, of indiscriminate criticism of science. Then they need to associate with those who are also sufficiently scientifically minded and scientifically educated. And they will get sophisticated understandings of the relationship between science and scripture. Now some devotees may have some or, or a little simpler understanding. You know, we follow Krishna, we don't follow. Uh, follow the, we don't believe this mundane scientists. Now, that is not a major issue that engages their intelligence. And that's why they, they are satisfied with that understanding. And that's fine for them. So the point here is that we all need to find our space and give others their space. Nabuddhi bhedam janaye agyanam karma sanginam joshayet sarva karmani vidvan yukta samachar. Krishna says, don't disturb the minds of others. That help them move towards Krishna. Sometimes we get very angry with someone, we get upset with somebody who is doing apparently something wrong and we want to give them a piece of our mind. But everybody in the world is already agitated and when they come to Krishna, they come to a temple, they come to devotee association, they want to calm themselves, they want to get some shelter. And our duty, of course sometimes we have to challenge people's conceptions but overall our purpose should be not to give others a peace of our mind, but to give others peace of mind. And to give others peace of mind doesn't necessarily mean speak, just speak sweet words, but we speak the truth, we speak about Krishna in a way that inspires people to come closer to Krishna. Not alienates them from Krishna, not drives them away from Krishna. So for this, different preachers may have to use creativity in different ways to attract people from different backgrounds and that creativity has to be given. I was talking with one senior devotee and he was adopting some very creative ways of, uh, of uh, attracting people. He's quite successful in attracting people. So then I asked him, mm, when you started this, how did you know that this was right? He said, I didn't know. He says, I didn't know but based on my my intelligence, my experience, my understanding of Srila Prabhupada, you know, I chose this action and I chose this mode of outreach and I was ready to bear the consequences if I was wrong. So it's not that we have to be definitively right before we do something. Sometimes we may try something in Krishna's service and rather than claiming that the super soul is speaking from within me and telling me this is right, he says, no, this is my understanding. Yathamati, yathashruti. As much as I have heard, as much as I have understood, according to that, I am serving Krishna in this way. And sometimes it will work and we can open a new avenue for outreach of Krishna. Sometimes it may not work and we realize, okay, this is not the way to move forward. 
we find some other way to move forward so this way if we leave room for creativity then lot of creative people will have space within krishna consciousness otherwise if we said no creativity then creative people will simply leave krishna consciousness <coughs> and then our movement will stagnate so this verse tells how krishna is pleased by the sages using creativity in analyzing material nature so similarly for applying the principles of bhakti in material world and attracting people to krishna we can also be creative so i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke on this theme of using creativity in devotional service uh, i talked about three main points first is what we can have is not reality what we understand is not reality but a mod models of reality so ayurveda and allopathy have different models each model is like a map and physical model map political map will show slightly different things so we use a model not necessarily based on the, it is real but based on whether it is functional whether it helps us to function so so, so uh, we don't have to mistake the map to be the territory but we don't have to reject the map just because it is not the territory we use the model as it is useful the second point i talked about is that if we uh, insist on positioning scripture as a competitor of science and we may be trying to be more traditional than the tradition so i talked about how in the tradition also the purpose of scripture is to tell us what the st science studies what matters S sorry science studies matter <coughs> scripture studies what matters so we see that the study of matter is not why arjuna comes to krishna for the bhagavad gita or parishit maharaj comes to uh, shukdev goswami they are not learning how to fight arch how to use archery or how to rule the kingdom that what matters you know what is dharma what is the right thing to do when i am faced with this war or what is the right thing to do when i am about to die so scripture focuses on that purpose even when it is talking about cosmology it doesn't go into the details it focuses on how the cosmos is pervaded with dharma that's why practicing dharma and practicing bhakti is what matters and then i talked about how within the tradition itself there is the bhagavad cosmology and there is the uh, jyotisha cosmology and our acharyas have been comfortable with using both as appropriate without necessarily being able to reconcile the both so because reality is complex we may need to learn to be comfortable with contradiction and that is why i brought the last point was humility means to acknowledge the complexity of reality and maturity means to find space for our reality while giving others the space for their reality so rather than thinking that this is what scripture says and in all situations this is what is to be applied we have to be we have to be humble and we see how prabhupad prabhupad was faith prabhupad was faithful to scripture but also prabhupad was resourceful in attracting people to the purpose of scripture attracting people to krishna so are the con conservatives may sometimes be right liberals may sometimes be right it depends on the context and what we can do is not that we have to change because we will be inclined to think in a particular way but we needn't claim that our way is the only way that we acknowledge that okay this is the way i think and this is the way i make sense of things if somebody else makes sense of things in a different way we saw this multiplicity of approaches even outside the bhakti path in the bhagavad gita and shri prabhupad at one level at that become committed devotees but another level prabhupad accommodated people who were even worshiping other 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 humans what to speak of other gods and he engaged them gradually so uh, so moving toward krishna is like moving up a pyramid to the top which where krishna is and we all will see things differently based on where, what height we are and what path we are taking up so if we learn to accommodate each other then we all can cooperatively <coughs> move toward krishna and ensure that others don't have unreasonable difficulties in coming toward krishna thank you very much hare krishna you have time for questions bro yes hi krishna oh, thank you so much for that class i really appreciate how you broke it down in sections first we would conceptualize the aspects fantastic i i have a question in regards to um uh science and uh, how we 
Um, so in some situations when we're distributing books, we meet you know people who you know probably are more inclined to you know, towards science and stuff like that. And one strategy that we might use to um, you know convince them to take a book would be that um, spiritual life is also a science uh, in the basis of. Um, you have a hypothesis, and then you take a practice, and then you have the, you draw conclusions based on the results. Um, seeing that you you know you're more inclined to the scientific side, what other methods do you reckon you could use to kind of um, encourage them to you know to think about it from that angle, um, from a, in a scientific way? Okay. Yeah. So how can we attract scientific people? One is we can say the spiritual life is also a science. Yeah. The definition of science itself is a matter of ongoing healthy dispute within science so broadly i have a whole seminar on this but i'll just try to explain briefly if you consider this is a circle as a body of scriptural knowledge so within this circle you can say there is one sector which agrees with modern science one sector which disagrees with modern science and the most of it is that which transcends modern science so science can neither prove nor disprove that there is a spiritual world where there's a bluish black cowherd boy wearing a peacock feather who is God. That is beyond the jurisdiction of science. Mm -hmm. It is not unscientific, it is trans scientific. So our purpose is that we we may sometimes talk about that scriptural knowledge that agrees with science. We might talk about say a third canto, the description of the womb. You know, there is advanced, it's, it's described thousands of years ago, the stages of how the womb goes through. That's advanced scientific knowledge, you could say. Something like that, but that's not the thrust. Our purpose is not the part of scripture that agrees with science or disagrees with science. We have to get them to that part which transcends science. So, so one definition of science, which I, I talked about is that, <coughs> is the mainstream definition is that, uh, you look for material explanations for material phenomena. Or it's called methodological naturalism in science. As at least a methodology, science looks for natural explanation for natural phenomena. So if we are going to equate science with methodological naturalism, then Krishna consciousness is trans scientific. Then the whole thrust of the outreach could be is there some are there some questions that science doesn't address? And there are. And uh, where do we get those answers? Einstein himself said that we can uh, he, he put it many different ways. He says Gravity can explain the falling of objects. Gravity can't explain people's falling in love. <laughs> he said we can talk about the moral foundations of science, the ethical foundations of science. We can't talk about the scientific foundation of ethics. So the science is not science is te it's technically called it's immoral. It's not moral. It's not immoral. It's immoral. It doesn't talk about morality. So uh, best is to actually help them understand that there is. There is a whole universe which of meaning which is not addressed by science. And that is what scripture provides. But within that, it is not just sentimentality. As you said, if we take the definition of science as a hypothesis, as an experiment, as a conclusion, then this is definitely, uh, it is definitely something which is repeatable and experienceable. In that sense, it is not just sentimental. So we have to be resourceful and see what works. So it is best not to confront people in the initial stages. So say Big Bang Theory or evolution or something like that, there is no need to get into those controversies or say space research or whatever. The important thing is get them to the essentials. Uh, if we consider it from the perspective in our practice of bhakti, how much does evolution or Big Bang or space research matter to our practice of bhakti? We hardly ever think about it. Then, when somebody is coming to Krishna, why do we have to present that? You know, oh, this theory is wrong, or this was not done, or that was done. Why? If that is not what we think about when you are practicing bhakti, why do we have to present it when they are introducing to bhakti? So, we have to find out what is the smoothest way. See, sometimes, some, say for many people, something is not an obstacle. But we think it is an obstacle and we try to bring it down. Say, for most people, you know, they approach science in a functional way. Even I, I have studied, I have talked with devotees who have PhDs in evolutionary science. And they, I ask, how do you reconcile the two? And they say, this is, we use it functionally, this is for our profession. And so, you know, they are here and Krishna is here. 
we have to find out what are the obstacles that are there in between and remove them. Sometimes you start criticizing evolution or sometimes criticizing space research or whatever. Then that was not an obstacle for them, but your criticism makes it an obstacle. Oh, that means I have to give this up to come to Krishna. Then, so instead of uh, instead of removing obstacles, we may be ending up erecting obstacles, and that's a great disservice. So don't presume, just uh, don't presume anything about people just because they're scientifically minded. Focus on just trying to attract them to Krishna. Okay, thank you. Oh. My question, I have two questions. One is um, in preaching. Preaching, when we are preaching, um, when we start talk about faith, Krishna, that's all fine. But when we talk about the regulated principles, I see people squirm. Literally, they're like, you know, uh, you talk about how, so my question is, do we present this? Because uh, irrespective, this is what it is. Um, and the other question is the giant leap of faith. You talk about all of this philosophy. Ultimately, it's the faith that defines that next step that they make. And that is not something that you can give somebody. It's something that they have it or they don't. And I just want to know your life. Okay. So people often squirm when they hear about the four eggs. So should we not talk about them? It's not that we shouldn't talk, but it has to be appropriately presented. Say, say a new version of the iPhone comes, say iPhone X or iPhone X Plus or whatever. Now does an ad of Apple start with the price of the iPhone? No, com no promotion of any device starts at the price. First, it starts with the features. Now this, 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 this. And then you have to click somewhere once, twice and then you find the price. Then you may decide, oh, do I want this or do I want it? not want it? But after you have seen the features, oh, maybe it's worth it. So similarly, we while sharing Krishna consciousness should focus on sharing the features. First, present the product, not the price of the product. Now, sometimes somebody is very proud. I brought an iPhone. They said, you know, this iPhone costs 1500 pounds. Now, there they are not attracting others to buy the iPhone. They are simply bragging how rich I am. So sometimes devotees are, we are like that, you know, how self-controlled I am, you know, I follow this, 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 this principles. Well, do people need to know that right now? So we don't want to hide the fact that we follow regs, but we have to give people a chance to understand what we are doing and what, what we are doing offers before what it costs. So if we don't give them that chance, then the, then the price seems so prohibitive that whatever, however good the product, I'm not interested in it. So we have to be careful in how we present. And always the positive side of Krishna consciousness needs to be more emphasized. That means that this is what Krishna consciousness is all about. And generally rules, uh, rather than, we have to sometimes present rules, but more than present, Prabhupada says, I was talking with one senior devotee who was in college preaching, when Prabhupada disciples in college preaching during Prabhupada's time. And Prabhupada told him, and he told me that you know, the, if you're doing college outreach, and I would say that applies to everyone nowadays, he says the worst thing you can do is present Krishna consciousness as a set of rules. He says, present the philosophy first. The philosophy gives a multi-dimensional explanation of why to live in a certain way. And then the rules start making sense. So we need to first present the features of Krishna consciousness and present the philosophical worldview. And then we can present the regs. We don't have to hide them, but definitely we don't have to parade them to others. Let's present the features of Krishna consciousness first. Okay. And uh, what was the second question? Faith. Yeah, so there's a giant leap of faith required. Uh, and if people don't have it, that's, there is, Vishnu Chakrathakur says in Madhuri Kadambini that there are two ways uh, a person may come to Krishna. One is, they have Swabhaviki Shraddha and they have, second is Bhalin Utpalita Shraddha. Swabhaviki means they have natural faith. Maybe because of their upbringing, maybe because of their previous life practice of Bhakti, they already have some faith. The other is Bhalin Utpalita. That means by the, by the interaction with the devotees, by the devotion of the devotee, by that Bala, by that strength, faith is engendered. 
So we might meet some people who are already very spiritually inclined, but they are few. So then, rather than saying that people have to take a giant leap of faith, now we have to become the bridge by which they can cross over to faith. Or we may have we have to become the bridge, or we have to build the bridge. So incrementally, okay, you do this. Can you do this? Can you do this? So we don't have to. Uh, present those aspects of scripture which people are going to find difficult to accept. There is a conversation of Prabhupada with his disciples in Hawaii and some disciples say that you know, we, when we talk with the scholars and we tell them about how many bodyguards uh, Ugrasen, King Ugrasen had. The Bhagavatam describes some astronomical number. So, he said they start laughing at us. They say that, you know, where did all these bodyguards live? Where were their homes? Where were their toilets? How could they live in such a small city like that? <laughs> now, Prabhupada could have taken a confrontational approach. He could have said that Krishna can sustain the whole world on the tip of a needle. But Prabhupada took a very pragmatic approach. Prabhupada says, among the thousand ver thousands of verses in the Bhagavatam, was that the only thing you found to speak to the scholars? <laughs> <laughs> mm. So we have to understand what is central. And, uh, and focus on that. So, if you look at the central aspects of Krishna consciousness, they require faith, but uh, they also appeal to the intelligence. That there is a non-material core to our being. You know, any thoughtful person will be open to the possibility hmm? that there is that, that there there can be ways to experience happiness higher than the material. People are open to that. That there might be some reality beyond the material. They may have some issues with the specifics of what we talk about. But if you look at the essentials, they are uh, they are reasonable. They don't, they don't require an unreasonable leap of faith. Yeah, and gradually as we keep practicing and experiencing, then we want to put more and more faith. So it's, it has to be an incremental process. And that's why it's very important that Krishna consciousness be presented progressively to people. Not like everything in one go. Present, that's how education works. You know, if, a kin, if a student who is studying maths in the first level is shown a PhD level triple integral calculus book and says this is what you have to study. Forget it, I am not going to study maths. Now, normal education works that you present people present the students what they can take at that level and that's how we have to do also so if we do that then it's a, it's not an unreasonable leap of faith it's a reasonable is a reasonable incremental steps forward in faith okay so thank you very much gantraj srimad bhagavatam ki shila prabhupada ki gaur bhakta vrind ki gaur premanande